from the campus studios of Sarland University, this is Ropecast, a lighthearted podcast for learners of English, with Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Hello, Ropecast listeners. Uh, I'm Roger Charlton, and again today I have the pleasure of welcoming a former colleague of mine, Ginny, who Hello. Uh, is American, but lived for quite a number of years uh, among Chinese people. And I just thought, well, what's it like for your average American, not Ginny, but an American traveler, an American business person goes to China for the first time, probably thinking, well, everybody speaks English these days. What do you think? What's it like for an American arriving in China for the first time? I think it probably depends on which airport that that, um, American arrives in, in Beijing, in Shanghai, uh, everything is in English, and it's bright and shiny and new and, and really sets the tone of, of China. Everything is bright and shiny and really modern. You, you just get this sense of ultra-modern, much more so than Europe or the United States. So it's you, that sets the tone. China is this high-tech, modern, beautiful country. Then maybe you arrive in a town like Xi'an which has a big airport. It's cavernous. It's so huge. And you think, where are the people? <laughs> Why are all of these 75 shelters empty? Why are, where are the people? Or you arrive in Zhuhai, and it's the same thing. There's this ultra-modern airport and no people. You have these little kids who are having these dance competitions in the middle of the floor <laughs> because there are just no people. And then you go outside of the airport and... It takes a while before you actually see anything because the road to get to the airport is so big. And because there are no people, there are no cars. China is planning for the future. So the, the, exp- or the, the realization at the airport is that there's a modern China and the rest of the country hasn't quite caught up with <laughs> the airports yet. So once you get out of the airport, you don't hear English everywhere like you did. And there's Starbucks in the airport and there's McDonald's in the airport. And then you get outside and the reality is there's not Starbucks everywhere, especially not as you move westward in China. Once you get past Xi'an, there are no more Starbucks. So if you go to Xinjiang province out there in Urumqi, you're not even going to hear English. You're not even going to hear uh, uh, Putanghua, so Mandarin Chinese. You're going to hear dialects. And if you studied Mandarin in college and you think, okay, I'm ready, I can order something, and the people are looking at you like you have two heads. <laughs> English is not going to help you. Mandarin's not going to help you. That hand and foot language is the language that you're going to use. <laughs> Fortunately, all Chinese people are really friendly and helpful, and they will figure out that you want some kind of food. The most important thing in Chinese culture is food. <laughs> Everything revolves around food. In Germany, it might be taxes. In the United <laughs> States, it might be politics. But in China, it's all about the food all the time. What did you learn about yourself by living among Chinese people? Because then, you know, the way they responded to you probably is quite revealing. Oh, it is. The first time in 1986, I went there as a young American, thinking that the United States was the center of the universe. (laughs) the most important country in the world because that's what we're all taught to think. And then when I got to Zhonghua, Zhong means center, Gua is land. So Zhonghua, China, means center of the universe. And uh, there, there's not room for two centers of the universe. <laughs> and somehow, because I was a minority and they were the majority, I had to learn that the United States was not the center of the universe, at least while I lived in China. China was the center of the universe, and that was really, really a humbling experience for an American. Yeah. So what other surprises were there? What a, let's see. Um, besides that the culture revolves around food all the time, the next thing was, well, if you eat a lot of food, then you need to go to the toilet. And um, China still has the squatties. And if you go to a nice hotel... They now have the Western-style sit-down toilets, but when you walk in there, you see that there are footprints on the toilet seat. 
And that was a little surprising to me until I realized that Chinese women still like the squatty. And if they go into a nice restaurant in a nice hotel where there's a sit-down toilet, they have to stand on the toilet seat. <laughs> that was a big surprise. <laughs> I can understand that, yes. Well, getting away from toilets... <laughs> Can we get back to pleasanter topics again? But that wasn't unpleasant. It's just <laughs> funny. <laughs> More Chinese speak English. There are little language schools that spring up like mushrooms all over the place. All Chinese parents want their one child, their little emperor or little empress, to speak English. So you have all these little children learning to speak English. Um, in the cities, there are always going to be English speakers. In the small towns and the countryside, it's going to be more of a, of a challenge to find English speakers. Although the people in the village will say, oh, I know somebody, you know, one of my friend's friend's friends, and they will send somebody who will speak English for you. So I think going to China is not so much of a, of a challenge. It's just a lot of fun to be there. Well, thank you very much for that, Ginny. Mm -hmm. And I hope we can welcome you back again <laughs> before too long. Sai Jin. Yeah, bye. You've been listening to Ropecast, brought to you by Saarland University, featuring Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Tune in for the next edifying episode on your podcast dial.